you thankful this morning? Are you ready to hear from the Lord this morning? Are you ready to praise Him some more this morning? Then praise His holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I am the God who lifts every burden. And I am the God who shows the way in the darkness. I will lead and I will guide you if you will but trust in me. Lift your voices in this time. Lift your voices in this day. And I shall show you the paths of righteousness. I shall lead you in the way, says the Lord. Only trust in me. If you need to know the way, He is that way. He is the only way. The way, the truth, and the life. You can trust in Him. That song, Leaning. Leaning on the arms of Jesus. Mm. There's no better place to be than to be leaning on His arms. Trusting in Him. Holding to His hand. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And He'll always, always without fail, no matter what you're going through, He'll always lead you through it. Amen? He'll always lead you through it regardless of what it is because He loves you that much. Amen? That's worthy to give Him praise for there. Put your trust in Him this morning. Go over to John chapter 13. This fits in with what we've been studying there in, in Philippians. Where we just left in Philippians in chapter 2, we, we looked at there where Christ, they, they call that the, uh, the kenosis of Christ. Sometimes i got to think of them words, those big words. But that, that self-emptying where Christ, or where the Apostle Paul had, had, had uh, uh, shown the church there in Philippi, he had given them the example of Christ, how that Christ had emptied himself, of himself if you will, he had... Let him, he had come to earth, he had come to be a man, and he had humbled himself in the form of a servant. He had given his life for us and paid the price for our sin. And that's what we're going to look at here as we see here in chapter 13. And, and what we see here from John chapter 13 all the way down to like John 17, it all took place in just a few hours' time. You know, a lot of times we read this and we think days or weeks or whatever, but this took place in just a few hours' time. It would just be a few hours before Jesus would be taken by the, the Romans and the Sanhedrin and stuff, that He would be taken in the garden and that He would be led off to be crucified. This was just that night before, just a few hours before all that would take place. This was the time where Judas where Judas would betray Christ. I was doing some study on that. And you know, in, in, in Old Testament times and in Bible times, whenever somebody would sit down and eat dinner with you, would sit down to a meal with you, that represented a, a time of trust. It represented a time of fellowship and communion with one another. And I was, as I was studying that, it, it, it talked about a time whenever... There were a couple of guys fixing to go to, to, to battle against one another and they realized that even their fathers uh, uh, several years before had sat down to have dinner with one another to have fellowship and communion together. And in the, the tradition of that time, the meal was so important at that time, that type of communion and fellowship, that those two guys that were fixing to go to fight one another realized, hey, we can't do this. Our dads, our fathers have had a time of communion, fellowship. And it, it, it bond them together as well. Boy, if we had some of that today, how much binding or how much right. more together yes, 
could we be as a people, as a nation, as a church, if we would realize that the importance of that fellowship and that communion. And that's what this was taking place here in this 13th chapter. Jesus and the disciples would have what we call the Last Supper. You know, we celebrated communion or we, we partook of communion last week. And that's what this was the very first representation of was that time of communion that time of fellowship that we can all have with Christ. You see, we don't have to wait for the first of the month or for us to have a certain little cracker or, or drink or whatever that is. You know, we don't have to wait to have communion with the Father. We can have communion with our Father, with the King of kings and the Lord of lords on a daily basis. And it doesn't revolve around having to have certain what we call sacraments today, but we can just come to Him. Come to Him. Come to His throne room. Obtain that time, that mercy, that grace that we need in our time of need. Are you in need this morning? We're all in need this morning. Yes, sir. We all need Him. Lord, I need Amen. you every hour. I need you, Lord. That should be the cry of our heart each and every day. Amen? Amen. So John chapter 13. I'll just begin in verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Hmm. Hmm. He loves you to the end. Mm -mm -mm. His love isn't a fleeting love. Our love often is with one another. But Jesus' love doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love is an everlasting love. He loves you even whenever, like Susie said a little this morning, that we take a bite of stupid or we do stupid or whatever it is, you know. He still loves you. He's still calling to you. When we fail, we sin, we fall back, we shrink back, sometimes in our stubbornness. He says, I still love you. Amen. I'm so thankful for His love. He don't throw us out when we act a fool. But he says, hey, come on. You know that ain't right. Come on. Draw near. My goodness, there's no God that man has come up with that says draw near. Every one of the false gods of this world says go away. Arm length distance. Our God says come. Come near to me and I'll come near to you. Verse 2 says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he had poured water in a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then comes Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus said to him, What I do, you know not. You know not now, but you shall know hereafter. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash you not, you have no part in me. Father, I'm asking you to take these few minutes, Lord. Touch the hearts and the lives of your people. Draw us near to you, my Savior, my God. Show us who you are, Lord, and who you want us to be, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. This is a pretty familiar portion of Scripture, you know, for anybody who's read the Bible, spent some time in the Word of God. This is the Last Supper as we see it. Like I said, this is the last few hours. This will be the last meal that Jesus will have with His disciples before His crucifixion. This will be the last time that they gather together and just sit down and, and you know, lay there or whatever they did it. You know, some say they reclined on, on, on couches, what they call pillows or their clothes or whatever it was that they would just sit there or lay there. And oftentimes at, at these types of meals they would have a time of teaching or discussion or, or, or just some deep thoughts as far as 
talking to one another. And Jesus would take advantage of this time to show the disciples who He really was and give them an example of that which He he wanted to work in them. This is really, other than the cross, the ultimate example of who Jesus is and what He wants you and I to be. And what He's doing here is as He... As they finish this meal and they they partake of this this last supper, as we've known to call it, you know, and this washing of feet, and don't worry, we're not going to get out the bowl and the towel and go wash each other's feet this morning. not saying there's anything wrong with that. I know there's some churches that that do that on a regular basis. But you don't want to to see my feet, my smelly feet. (laughs) But anyway, we're not going to go that way. If you want to go washing some feet, you go right ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. But oftentimes, churches and people, we tend tend to take these things as we do with communion and make them something more than what they are. But what Jesus is trying to show us here is that He has emptied Himself of Himself. He's saying, I'm not thinking of myself as being anything more than you are. He's saying, actually, He's told the disciples before, He who is greatest among you must be the servant of all, must be willing to serve. Boy, if we had some of that in government today. If, if, if our government officials would understand that their place is not to rule and to reign over, but to serve the people who Amen. put them in the position Amen. that they are in. Boy, if we would learn this in our homes. We can all agree on that for government, can't we? But, whoa, wait a minute. When it comes down to our homes, to our lives, yes. to how we treat one another. Hmm. Sometimes that hits kind of hard to us, doesn't it? But you know, we've talked about that image of Christ that the Holy Spirit is trying to make in each and every one of us. And we've talked about how that that Jesus is is trying to, to bring us in, or the Holy Spirit is trying to bring us into that image, and that image ultimately being that one of faith in God, that one of faith. Taking God as His Word. You know, we look at at Adam in the garden and before the fall. Adam believed everything that God had said. Adam took God at His Word. His faith and his trust was in God. And it wasn't until the enemy came in and put that question in Adam's heart and it's been in every man's heart ever since then. Did God really say this? And because of that, sin entered into the hearts and lives of men and women in this world. And we know the results of that. We're seeing it today in in our lives, in this world, in our families. My, the destruction that the enemy wants to bring to families today. To destroy that very institution that God, as we saw there a a few weeks ago, that God originally established even before the fall. A holy institution and that the enemy's trying to tear it down one brick at a time. He's patient. He's been working a long time. What we see today in our nation and in this world is nothing new. But it's the culmination of an enemy that knows his time's at hand. He don't have much time and he's working even more so to try to destroy, to kill, to steal, and to destroy, and to take down, to tear down that which God has established. You see, if he can tear down the family, he tears down the Word of God. That's right. That's right. He's not going to succeed. Because God will always have, God will always triumph. Amen. It may look like, like it will in the time of the battle of Armageddon, that the enemy is going to triumph and destroy all of Israel. It may look like the enemy is going to triumph and destroy the family, destroy the church. It's not going to work because God has the last say. Amen? Amen. So Jesus, here at this Last Supper, this time that He would spend, and and like I said, from 13 down to like 16, and and, in chapters 16 and 17, these are the last words. These are the last time that Jesus will have to to spend with His disciples. And it's important as we read through here that we understand that what He is important... Or is 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 giving, importing to them, however you would say, is of importance to us. That we need to be listening as they needed to be listening. You know, he would tell Peter here, he says, What I do you know not, but you shall know hereafter. You don't know what's going on right now, Peter, but you're going to understand it. 
Later on, you're going to see that what I'm showing you here is what the Holy Spirit is going to work in you. And see, we need the Holy Spirit working this in our hearts and in our lives, each one of us, for our families and for our churches and for our nation today. If we can understand this and, and get the picture of what Jesus is showing us here, it's going to make a difference everywhere. It's going to make a difference in how you treat your children and how you treat your wife, how you treat your co-worker and so forth. And you know, Jesus didn't say do this and everything's going to be hunky-dory with you. There's people going to try to take advantage of you. Hmm. There's people that are going to say, boy, he's a pushover. I can get away with anything from him. But you know what? God sees it. And what we need to to deal with in our heart is how God sees us. Not worry about everything else. Not worry about how our friends see us or our kids see us. But worry about how God sees us. Yes, Lord. The move of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. You know, verse 3, he says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, that He was come from God and went to God, the Father had given all things into Jesus' hands. You know what that spoke to me as, as I was reading and studying through this. Jesus knew where He was going. Jesus knew that He was going to the cross. And Jesus as well, having all things put into His hands, God was saying, it's your decision, Son. If you want to go, do what you... My will is that you go. My will is that you pay the price. But He had given Jesus because Jesus said that He could have called down 10,000 angels, a legion of angels, if He had wanted to. But Jesus said, not my will, but Thy will be done in the garden. Jesus said, Lord, if there be anything, if this cup pack, can this, can, is there any other way that this cup could pass from me? He had given Himself over to the Father's will. See, that's where you and I need to be. That's that image of Christ that needs to be made in us. That we trust in the Father's will. That we trust in God's Word to the extent and to the point. God's not called any of us to go to the cross per se. But He has, Jesus has said in Luke chapter 9, He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up His cross daily and follow Me. And we've looked at that deny Himself, that word deny. When you look back and you look at the root meaning of that word, it means to forsake faith in, or forsake as a first faith. Mm. Who is it we have faith in first and foremost? It's me. I follow my heart, as wicked and deceitful as it is. Anybody ever tells you, well, just follow your heart, you better run from that person. Because they ain't got a clue. But you see, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must forsake faith in himself first and follow me. Put your faith in God. Put your faith in Christ, who he is and what he did for us at Calvary. And we're not going to be afraid to lay down our lives. We're not going to be afraid to, as the Word of God tells us, to, to consider others more important than ourselves. Are we? Because we know that God's got our life in His hands. See, Jesus knew that God had His life. Jesus knew that what He was doing was the Father's will. And if it's God's will, then God's going to take care of you. If it's God's will, you don't have to fear what man can do. You don't have to fear the enemy himself. You don't have to fear anything, but you can trust in God that He's going to take care of you. Amen. That whatever the situation is, He's got your back. He's got your front. He's got your side. He's got you covered. Mm. You're walking on His ground. Amen? Amen. All the way around. You can put your trust in Him. Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into His hands, that He was come from God and went to God, He rose up from supper, He laid aside His garments. Boy, we need to be laying aside some garments today. That old man put off the old man and put on the new, Paul would say. 
We need to be laying aside those things that confound, those things that, that, that cause us trouble in our hearts and our lives. We need to be laying aside those things. There's a couple of things here that we see in this passage. One is the sanctification of the believer. And the other is, along with that, the work of the Holy Spirit and in, in, in helping us to lay aside self and not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We see both those examples here in what Christ is, is demonstrating just in this little portion of this after meal activity, if you will. Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into His hands and that He was come from God and went to God, rose up from supper, laid aside His garments and took a towel and girded Himself. After that He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith He was girded. Now understanding this, that this job of washing the, the, the disciples' feet was a job that was generally reserved for the lowest of the lowest of the slaves in the household. This was something that nobody wanted to do because in that day, they didn't have a sewer system. In that day, as they walked through the streets and the, 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 the alleyways of the town there from the lower to the upper portion of the town, usually in the upper portion it wasn't as bad as it was in the lower portion, but, it, but the, they would take the bedpan and dump it out the window onto the street right. where people had to walk. Not to mention just the fact of the dusty, dirty roads. That alone. People then didn't have shoes yes. like we do that covered their whole foot a lot of times. They had sandals. And so their feet got really dirty. That's a, tip, a, a type, a, 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 a typification. Maybe that's not a word. I don't know for sure. But it is now since I said it. But anyway, that is a type of our walk in this world as becoming believers. You know, Jesus is going to tell Peter later on down here. He said, you don't need to be clean completely. You just need the washing of your feet. That speaks of sanctification. That speaks of your and I's need. Any of you go out into the world during the day? We work a job. We go to the grocery store. We mingle. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. That, doesn't mean, that means that we don't partake of the things of the world, but we're still out here. We still hear the things going on in the world. We still hear the conversations of the world. We still see the stuff of the world, and it pollutes. That feet, that washing of feet that Jesus takes place here, that takes place here on this, this Last Supper, that washing of the disciples' feet, is a type and a shadow of what you and I go through today and how that we need a cleansing. Right. We need that cleansing on a daily basis. You see, whenever they came into this meal, this was one of the, the most important meal, the dinner time meal, as we would call it today, supper. You know, that, that meal, not lunch, but supper. I don't know how some people say it different. But that supper meal that we would have there in the late evening, People would come into that. That was the most important meal of the day. And in that meal, they would come in and they would wash their hands. And there would be somebody there to wash their feet. Because oftentimes, they laid reclining. They didn't sit at chairs like we do a lot of times where their feet didn't really matter. But they would be reclined on like their elbow or something and their feet kind of outstretched so everybody could see their dirty feet. You know, no socks. But there was a need there in that day and time for there to be that physical washing. There's a need in our day and time. That physical washing there represents the spiritual washing that you and I need there. And I think it's Ephesians that talks about the washing of the water of the Word. Mm. Mm. You and I, need, we need. And I'm going to tell you, you need it. Not making a law of it but it's a need in your life that you need to recognize that you need a daily washing from being out in the filth, from being out in the pollution of this world. Like the brother said this morning, even before we get up and get out of bed and go to work in the morning, we need to be spending some time with the Lord to prepare to be ready to meet this world. To be ready for what we're going to go through during the day. And then maybe when we get home, we need some washing. 
of the water of the word. Not making a law of it, but it's a need in our hearts and our life to spend some time with the Lord. Spending some time in His Word saying, God, I'm so dirty. <coughs> You're going to get dirty mingling with the world. What are they, carnal Christians? Words that don't even really go together? You know, if you're not getting some washing, pretty soon that dirt, that yuck, is going to be crusty on you. It's going to get in the way. It's going to trip you up. Mm. Dragging around those weights and sins that so easily beset us. You need a daily washing of the Word. That talks about sanctification. That talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. What is that? What does sanctification mean? The word in the Greek is 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 is, is hagios. It means to set apart. Hmm. We have been set apart. We are set apart when we're saved. But we need a daily setting apart, daily coming out from among them and being separate, saith the Lord. We need that daily in our hearts and in our lives. If you think you don't, you better think again. I guarantee you your wife will tell you you do. Or your friend, whatever. But there needs to be a daily cleansing in our hearts and in our lives. That's what this that's one of the aspects of what this is talking about here. You know, isn't it something how that in the Word of God, He can cover all kinds of stuff pertaining to our hearts and lives and just a few places and he can cover multiple things in just a couple or one example like this example here Jesus is covering multiple things that need to be dealt with in our hearts and in our lives that need for daily sanctification verse 6 he says when Simon Peter then comes Simon Peter and said to him Lord do you wash my feet and Jesus said what I do you know not now but you shall know hereafter and Peter said to him, You'll never wash my feet. And that never there, it means never, not ever, not, not at all. Jesus, you ain't doing it. You're not washing my feet. Boy, some have that attitude today. Mm -hmm -hmm. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash you not, you have no part in me. Mm-mm-mm. What he said to Peter applies to us today. You know, there's that, I heard a little bit on this morning on the radio coming in, they were talking about that, uh, it was a replay, I think, of Message of the Cross. And they were talking about the movement in the church today called this grace movement, mainly propagated by a guy named Joseph, what's his last name? Prince. Put forth by them. And this teaching, you know, and it's not just him, but he's one of the main propagators of it. But this teaching says that, oh, you, you, you never have to repent. After having repented of sin once, you know, it's all covered. It's covered by the blood. You don't have to repent of your sin anymore. And they go so far as to say that the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer will never convict the believer of sin in their life. I want to tell you right now, that is a false teaching. That is wrong doctrine. <clears throat> that teaching will lead to a seared conscience. That teaching will lead to a falling away from the faith in Christ. You know, they try to pull out things like, well, Jesus paid it all on Calvary's cross and therefore you don't have to worry about it anymore. And that if the Holy Spirit, if you're feeling conviction of sin, then it's, it's not the Holy Spirit, that that's the devil. You know, that's, that, that, that's pat him out to blaspheme in the Holy Spirit. To be given his, uh, or attributing His work to the work of Satan. You know, that, that's what the Pharisees and them did to Jesus. Oh, he does this by Beelzebub, the prince of darkness or whatever. Same kind of idea there. But I want to tell you the Holy Spirit will convict. He convicts the world of sin and we're part of the world. He's going to convict you. You need to be asking. David would say in the Psalms, Lord, search me and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. You know, showing us that, yeah, even though we're saved, this is showing us, even though we're saved, we need that continual showing, that continual 
help of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding and teaching us, showing us where we're going wrong. Because I'll guarantee you we all are. Somewhere. We may not realize it right now. We might be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm great. There ain't no sin in my life. But the Holy Spirit's going to say, wait a minute. That was a little bit of a sin there, friend. <laughs> You're thinking a little more highly of yourself than you ought to. You know? Got to be careful, don't we? Mm -mm -mm. Need to be seeking the Lord. Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I wash you not, you have no part in me. Pretty, don't take Jesus a whole lot of words to get the point across, does it? You know, he don't need no flowery words. He didn't need to go into a big dissertation with Peter. He's just like, hey, if I don't wash it, if I don't wash you, you're none of mine. No part in me. Mm, we need to be letting him wash us, folks. I wonder what he says to those who put forth that doctrine of the Holy Spirit doesn't convict of sin. Oh, I don't need to confess my sin. Mm. If I don't wash you. He's talking about sanctification here. You have no part in me. Be careful the things you hear on TV, the things you listen to on the radio. Line them up with the Word of God. Things you hear here, line it up with the Word of God. Make sure it's right. And Simon Peter said to him, verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yo, Peter goes from one extreme to the other. You ain't touching me with that water. And then, oh, wait a minute. Give it all to me. That's how we need to be, though, with him. They're, they're Peter, I mean, though Peter is an up and down kind of guy. We need to be saying, Jesus, Lord, give it all to me. Lord, I want all that you have. Lord, fill me overflowing with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, come into my heart. Draw me to you. Wash me, Lord, wherever I need cleansing is what Peter is saying here. Whatever's dirty in me, search it out, Lord, and cleanse me. Mm. You're not going to hide anything from God anyway. You're not going to keep, you're not going to have your little, I'm going to tuck it under here, you know, God ain't going to see that sin. I can hang on to it and pet my little puppy. Mm -mm. He, you're not going to hide it from God. He sees it. When He reveals it, it ain't no good to say, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're pros at that. I didn't do it. I like those little cartoons, a family circle. You know, y'all ever seen them? And they got the, the little guy drawn out, kind of supposed to be kind of a, I don't know, ghost or something like that. He's not visible. But uh, mama says, hey, who did this? Not me. Not me. Not me did it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're that way with God. Not me. God points it out to us. Not me. I didn't do it. And, oh, that ain't me. That's, so that's them over there. That's how we act sometimes, don't we? When the Lord brings those things, shows us those things in our life. You know the best thing you can do when He shows you something? You say, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Take the coal, Lord. Cleanse my lips. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul would say. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Only Jesus can deliver us from that death, from that body. So Peter said, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He that's washed needs not, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. He's speaking of Judas Iscariot there. He knew who it was that would betray him. But he's telling Peter here, you don't need me to rewash you again. We don't need to get re-saved when we fail the Lord over and over. We just need to come to Him and say, Lord, forgive me. Wash me of this sin, Lord. Wash me that confess your sin, John would say. If we, are, if, if we will confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's unrighteousness? It's anything that's not in God's way, that's not in God's will. It's any thought, any action, Anything that's not in line with what God has for us. Lord, cleanse me. Those things I'm putting my trust in, Lord, that's not Christ and Him crucified. Lord, forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me with Your Word. By Your power. 
Lord, do that work in me. You know, oftentimes we, uh, we look at our brother, our sister, our wife, our husband, whoever it might be. God, you got to fix them. Our co-worker or whatever. God, you got to fix them. When God's telling you, hey, let's deal with you. I'll fix you. You let me fix them. Ah, oh, the boat and the beam. We're pros at it, aren't we? Pointing out those things. So he moves on and he says, you know, after he says, you know, all of them, that, that everybody was clean except for one, but not all, he said he knew who should betray him. And for that reason, or therefore, said he, you're not all clean. Mm. 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 You can be in Jesus' group of 12 and still not be saved. Mm. Walking with him. Can you imagine that? Maybe we can. Walking with the Lord day by day for three years. Jesus called these guys. Called them from the boat. Called them from the tax table. Hey, come and follow me. He called Judas just like he called the rest of them. And Judas betrayed him. Jesus is saying here he was never. There's people in the church Word of God tells us, I think um, we're about to see it in Romans, in our study in Romans, to beware. You know, that there'll be even some that come, even from your own ranks, from your own household, your own group. God knows the state of affairs of our heart. You're not fooling Him. No, God knows my heart. I can go to the bar and do whatever I want on Saturday. God knows my heart on Sunday. Yeah, He knows your heart. He knows your heart. You're not fooling Him. You're not going to get by with anything. He said, For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, you're, you're, you, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said to them, Know ye, know ye what I've done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So what Jesus is saying here is, He's saying, I, <clears throat> I am the Lord of lords, the King of kings. I am your master, your teacher. And if I have humbled myself, and I have come and I have humbled myself to even the most lowliest of servants, and I have humbled myself and lowly washed your feet, you see, this is where we take this verse and we kind of go array in it or awry or we mess up and we start saying, oh, well, we have to go wash each other's feet and that makes us somehow righteous. You know what? You can wash all the feet in the world if you have the wrong attitude. Yes, right. You see, it's the attitude of our heart that Jesus is talking about here. We can, you can go wash every... You can go wash those guys out there on the street look at, saying, we'll work for food or whatever. Wash their feet... And if you do it with the wrong attitude. You see, feet washing was only a, an example here that Jesus used. It's not wrong if you want to go do that. But have the right attitude. If you want to go and help people, if you want to go mow grandma's yard, have the right attitude. If you want to help those in need, have the right attitude. That servant attitude that Christ had that said, because of what Jesus has done for me. And because of what I see in Him and the work that the Holy Spirit is working in me, I can go and help them. If you're doing what you're doing at the church or witnessing or anything else, if you're doing what you're doing to be seen of men, you're doing it in the wrong attitude. Right. Right. Mm. Right. needs to be a contentment to say, I'll go clean the toilet and I don't need anybody to know I did it. You hear me? Be careful of the attitude of our hearts. That's what he's talking about here. He said, As I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of others. You know what Jesus is also saying here is, and what he's saying in going to the cross, he's saying that we should be as willing not only to just go to the washing of the feet, but we need to be willing to give our lives for one another. Hmm. What is it he talks about? No greater love has any man than this. Yes. 
than that he lay down his life for his friends. Then he goes on and says that, you know, some would die for this and some for that. But nobody's willing really to die for somebody else. And you know, what I'm seeing here is, too, it's not necessarily physically physical death that he's talking about. It's that death to self. If any man will come after me, deny himself. You see, we're called to have a daily. Paul says, I die daily. That dying to self, our own, you know, not only just our own thinking, our own strengths and abilities and living for the Lord, but also for taking this gospel message to the world around us. It's what we've been studying there in Romans. Are we willing to lay down our lives that those folks over there might hear the gospel? That's what Paul did. He took no regard for his own life, willing time after time to be beaten, to be put in prison, to, what does he say, bear the marks in my body for Christ? Do we love them enough to lay down our life? That's what Jesus is talking about here. Loving our family enough to tell them about Jesus. Are we willing to risk this is something for all of us. Are we willing to risk our reputation of being a good old boy? Are we willing to put it all on the line to tell somebody about Jesus? Or to say, to give them that reason for the hope that's within us? A lot of times we take that light and try to hide it under a bushel. But we need to be willing if even so, to go to the chopping block. We saw there in Romans this last Thursday, Paul speaking of Priscilla and Aquila. He said they were willing to put their heads on the block, basically, for my sake. Hmm. Jesus died for us. Can we do no less for our brothers and sisters, for our friends and family, for a lost and dying world? You know, the devil, he's in, he's in a battle. And he's, in a, he's playing for keeps. The devil's not playing the game. Too many times we play games. Too many times we uh, skirt around things. Oh, well, I can't say anything because that might... If it gets you in trouble, it gets you in trouble. Say it. What are you afraid of? You see, a lot of times we're afraid for ourselves. We're not trusting the Lord. And we're afraid what men will do to us. Whenever If we're trusting Him, we're not going to be afraid. Paul wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to tell even Nero in his house. You know, even you, you almost persuade me, Paul. He wasn't afraid to say, thus saith the Lord. To stand up and be counted. Mm. I'm teaching to me as much as I'm teaching to y'all. Right. It's time to take a stand, guys. That's right. It's time to say, I'm going after Jesus. I'm following after him. I ain't turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of other. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily the servant, I say unto you, the servant's not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. You see what he's saying? Jesus was willing to be that servant. He was willing to lay down everything. God was willing to send his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was willing to give that for us. Should we not be willing to give all that we have for our brothers, our sisters, that the gospel might go forth in the name of Jesus to give our lives. He speak, he says, if you, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. I tell you before it come, that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. If anybody had any doubts, Jesus is saying, 
when Judas gives me that kiss, you're going to know what I told you was true. Verily I say to you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receives me. And he that receives me receives him that sent me. Jesus is sending us today. He's sending you today. He's sending you to people that the rest of us will never see. That I'll never see. You work with people that I'll never see. I'll never know. I work with people you'll never know. You see people at the store that we'll never see. The Lord is sending all of us. That's what He's talking about here. He's sending us all into this world. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. And He says, I will be with you always. He's got a work for you to do. Whoever you are, wherever you are. He's got something for you. He's sending you. What is it? The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's given all of us gifts. He's given all of us a calling, whatever that calling might be. He's sending you. Wherever you're at is where He sent you. You know, God's not, He's not unaware of what's going on in your life. He's not unaware of what you've been going, what you've gone through. He's allowed every step of the way to prepare you for where He has you now. Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, let me lay down my life to reach my neighbor, my co-worker, whoever. And you know, I've said it before. You know, a lot of times Susie has a cousin that she was talking to this week and she was feeling, I guess, ineffective and how she had possibly been ministering to a brother or another cousin or somebody, you know. And it was like she wasn't doing it well enough to reach them. I want to tell you something. You sow the seed. You plow the ground. I think I said it Thursday. You, some till, some plant, some water. But God's the one who gives the increase. You see, as we plow and we tilt and we plant, then we look to Him. Somebody else might come along and say just that right word to them that God knows and they give their hearts and their life to Christ. But you know what? Just like with the brother we sent the Bible to there in Barbados, if he goes and witnesses, and I'm praying he does, to other people there and people get saved, we all have had a part in that. Can you realize, uh, Paul, that vision, come over and help us. And there certain people were saved because Paul obeyed the Holy Spirit. Paul has a part in every one of our salvation because he went to Macedonia, that, that, that edge of the Western world at that time, and from there the gospel spread into Europe and eventually came here to us or was taken by our forefather, whoever, not all of us have forefathers over there, but you know what I mean. It's because Paul was obedient then and took the gospel to maybe just a few there. And then those few took it to another few. The gospel's gone to Barbados. Maybe it'll, they'll start a church down there preaching the message of the cross. You see what I'm saying? Don't ever underestimate. I've said it before. What little, that little seed like I said earlier, that you have the privilege of partaking and planting. You don't even have to plant the whole seed. Right. Just be, be willing to be a part, be willing to lay down of yourself. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing, there, your job's no more, your job's not more important. What you're doing after church today is not more important. Are we willing to lay down ourselves? to humble ourselves and take the gospel to the world around us. I'm going to pick up on the rest of this for next week for Easter because like I said, these are the last words that Christ would speak to His disciples before going to the cross. Last time He would spend any length of time with them before going to Calvary. His last words are important words and words that we need to hear.
mostly there in chapter 14 and 15 and into 16, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And this all took place at dinner time, before they went to the garden and before he was betrayed. Amen? Let's stand this morning. Let's settle it in our hearts this morning. The Lord, you've saved me. Word of God says that we're debtors to take this gospel to the rest of the world. But because of what Christ has done for us, we need to be willing to lay down ourselves and take this gospel message to the world around us. However God has for you to do that is between you and Him. I'm not telling you you have to do a certain thing a certain way because that's not my place. He's got a thing for me. He's got something for you. If we can help, awesome. If you can help us, awesome. You know, a lot of times we, uh, we say, oh, just give some money and that'll help. Maybe God's got more for you to do than just give a dollar or two or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't give it, but I'm just saying don't let that be the only way you give. You know, I told somebody the other day he was talking about tithing and stuff. I'm not all hung up on tithing. You know, tithing is a tenth. God gave you everything. He only asks you to give back. You can tithe of your time and of your money and of your talent, whatever it might be. So to me, tithe is not just in dollars and cents, but it's in everything that God has given you to give. That's what I'm trying to say here. Give in any way that He shows for you to give. If it's to go speak to somebody at the nursing home, you don't have to say, oh, I'm from Cross Life Fellowship and we're coming. No, you can say, God wants me to come and talk and spend some time with some of these. Whatever, you hear what I'm saying? It don't have to be done through the church. And you don't have to say, you won't be saying, hey, looky what I did. You'll just be going doing the work of the ministry. Amen? Father, I'm asking you to take your people, Lord. I'm asking you to take this word, put it down deep in our hearts, Father. Lord, that we would be given over to do your will, to give in our lives for you, Father, that your gospel message might go forth. Lord, touch your people, touch their hearts, Lord. Show us, Father, Lord, as we ask of you, Show us what you would have us do for you, Lord, this week, Lord, and in weeks to come. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Does anybody need prayer this morning? As the girls, as the ladies sing this song, if y'all need prayer this morning, come come down here at the front and I'll pray with you or some of the other brothers pray with you if you want to just spend some time here at the chairs. If you just want to spend some time where you're at, talking to the Lord saying Lord here I am here am I send me teach me and show me Lord. spend a few times with him as we worship as we sing this song you let him he'll get a hold and he won't let go he'll keep drawing you he'll keep calling you keep seeking him amen keep on keeping on keep on trusting and he'll take care of you